Okay, we're live. Yay! Okay. All right, so live streamers, we were waiting to get everybody seated, and we really want to find out what y'all are doing tonight. Um, we're not having the cold weather that we're supposed to have for December, not yet, although we don't want it as cold as it got, right? I mean, January, yeah, January. Thank you, Jeff. It is January. Anyway, so we just want to know, are y'all at home? Because here's what we're thinking. And we talked about it so much that now maybe we want to go home and do what y'all are doing. We're thinking that you're home in your fuzzy socks and your pajama pants, having popcorn or something else yummy and some hot chocolate, something like that, and getting ready. You're all snuggled down on your couch. Maybe you have your cat or dog on your lap. So we're just... Yeah, I know. See, right? Amy's like, can I go home now? Right? So anyway, we just wanted to know what y'all were doing. But we're glad that whatever it is, fuzzy socks, Bill prefers fuzzy socks to no socks. You know how he loves feet. But if y'all are home and you're joining us and you have your fuzzy socks on, we're just glad that you're here. Anyway, thanks for joining us tonight. We just always want to make our, the rest of our family feel welcome. And welcome to everybody who came out tonight. I have on my broken phone here, I learned to navigate past my broken home button for now. I feel so accomplished. Okay, a few announcements before we get started. We had a very large family gathering in here last Shabbat. Wasn't that awesome? So we had a full house and had to bring out extra chairs. That is great. The only thing that was uh, a drawback besides the, the heat that we, our bodies generated was the trash that our mouths generated on the floor from our little snacks and water bottles and things like that. So uh, Mike had asked, because he's the lucky guy who gets to come in here after we're all gone right before he turns the lights out and collect bags of garbage. So I want us to just have a contest with ourselves that we're going to make it to where he doesn't find so much as a piece of a tissue in here when we leave this building. Because I am a firm believer that if we're asking the Father to help us get into our home, permanent home facility, he's not going to do that if we're not taking care of our temporary facility. So it's kind of like, you know, you're not going to give your kids a new toy if they're over there not taking care of or tearing up the one. And not, not anybody's tearing anything up, but let's be respectful of the ones who have to come in and clean up behind us. There should be nothing for them to clean up behind us. So I told them I would go full-fledged mama on y'all, but I held back. So I we're just gonna see what happens, right? So anyway, um, lost and found. Okay, so I am going full-fledged mama on this one because they said you better get rid of some stuff. So we're going to get rid of some stuff. So one week from tonight, that means you have three services. One week from tonight is the deadline to go pick up any of your missing items. And I'll tell you where they are, but I first want to stress that gives you three opportunities. You have tonight after service, you have after uh, service on Shabbat, and then you have next Wednesday night after service. Because Thursday, I'm going to go through and see what I want. <laughs> and then it's going away. So, you know, seriously, we do have three services tonight, Shabbat, and one uh, Wednesday next week. And go upstairs as you come into the doors here, you know, where we go up the up stairs, you know, up only. If you get to the top of those stairs and then you look to the left, you'll see a room in there that has the shelving in there where the uh, junior quiver meets. There's shelving in there. All of the stuff is in there on the shelves. Um, please take what belongs to you because we're not thrift shopping in there yet. You know, it might be that somebody comes and they're the last person and they have lost their favorite coat and mom's about to really yank their ear on this one and they find it and so you save their hearing. So just don't take it if it doesn't belong to you. But do take what belongs to you and if you know somebody that you can reunite with their article that's up there, by all means, take it to them um, and, and reconnect them. If you have any missing, like a, we found a single earring um, and some other just miscellaneous jewelry type pieces, they're in the white envelope that's also on that shelf. So they have said it must go. So there you have it. It will go. So go up there tonight. 
make yourself a note on your phone, set yourself an alarm that before you leave the building that you're going to go upstairs and check for what's up there. Uh, another quick reminder, parents of treasures, if this is your first time to take your treasures to a class here when we dismiss in a few minutes, then we would like for the parents to go with them for the first time because they're going to need to get a little information. So if they need to come get you during the service, they'll know who they're looking for or what child's name to put on the screen. You know, with the parents of Johnny, please come to Treasures. Um, and that way we can get you and your child back together if something should require that to happen. Um, and then next Wednesday, Brennan is going to have another production workshop slash orientation for those who want to sign up. Um, they definitely want to have more help. They need more help. They're kind of running with a skeleton crew um, for different reasons, and they need some more volunteers. And it's a lot of fun from what I say, and I've worked on the headphones before, and it gets a little comical on there. So um, it can be fun, but that's not the only reason to do it. We need to serve. So if that's you, you have an interest in that, then see Brandon. It will be at 5 o'clock next Wednesday night here, but let him know that you're interested in doing that so that he can uh, be prepared. Again, a production workshop for volunteers. Reminder that our volunteer fair is coming up. That's this weekend. Yeah, that's this weekend and next Wednesday, which is the last night to go upstairs to claim your lost and found. Remember that? So I'm just gonna, y'all, I'm gonna just drill that. Anyway, um, remember to be praying about what you would like to volunteer to do. How's the Father telling you that you need to serve? And we're all a family, and it takes all of us to make it work, to make it run smoothly. So pray about that thing that you feel like He's calling you to do. And then we'll have tables set up over here uh, during Oneg, and you can go over and read the description and sign up. There'll be a sign up sheet there. And once you're signed up, then the team leaders will um, get with you and probably have some kind of a little workshop to see if you really intended to do that. Is this a good fit for you? Um, and they can take it from there. Um, I felt like I had one other thing. What am I forgetting? Um, oh, lost and found. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're found, Joffrey. He was lost, now he's found. Anyway, yes, please remember to go by and do that tonight. And now I do, I am gonna check the live stream chat to see just how many of our live stream family was uh, actually sitting there in pajamas. How many of you were sitting in pajamas and fuzzy socks? Bill's thankful you wore socks. We don't want pictures. But uh, actually, I would like pictures of the fuzzy socks, but he doesn't want a picture of your toes. But, you know, let us know what you were doing because y'all can see what we're doing, but we can't see what y'all are doing. So anyway, and then I think that was it. So we, okay, and now I'll turn you over to Mr. Bill Cloud. All righty, how's everyone doing tonight? Let's see what we got here. I'm, I'm looking at your notes, man. No, I'm just saying, go sit down. <laughs> All righty, I hope everyone's having a good evening. Um, I, I just have one quick announcement, and uh, we've been sitting on this one for a little while. But I just got off the phone with Paul Wilbur, and um, he just confirmed that this Shavuot, he, Marty Getz, and Joshua Aaron are going to be joining us for Shavuot. That Friday night, and then that Saturday night. Um, all three of them are going to be just kind of working together, and we're just going to have a big Messianic music hoedown for that weekend. So I just got off the phone with him, so I was waiting for that one last little piece to fall into place. So um, we're going to start talking that up, and he and all the others are going to start promoting it on their, their different websites and things like that. So we, we do want to talk it up because we just want to have a full house over at OCI for Shavuot. So, so anyway, you guys are the first to know. You guys are the first to know. So uh, I hope you're 
excited about that, be praying about that. When they were back, uh, when they were here back at Yom Teruah, we were, we were just in the kitchen one night and I said, has there ever been like a, um, an all-star messianic concert, you know? <laughs> that, was, that was my words. And he said, I've always wanted to do that. I said, well, if there could be three people that you could choose to do it, who would it be? And he named off the three that I had in my head, and those are the three that are going to be here with us. So, I don't know. It's God, you know. Anyway, so I thought my, you might be excited about that. Of course, be looking for uh, um, all of our announcements about Pesach, too. Uh, we'll be doing that again at OCI. We've just gotten a lot of these details nailed down just in the last few days. So anyway, I'm kind of excited about that. This, you know, I don't know that that's ever been done before. So if Lord willing that everything works out, uh, he's going to do it right here at Jacob's tent. So, all righty, with that, let's dismiss into our classes, treasures four through nine. Follow Miss Nayla out the door, please. Oh, if, you are, if, if this is your first time tonight, uh, parents, please go with them so that they can get some information from you. There's no card. Oh, okay. All right. So Junior Quiver, 10 through 13 over here. Senior quiver, 14 through 18, head that way. All righty. So last week, I think it was last week, I contacted Joffrey and I, I perceive that Joffrey has been wanting to say something and share some things with us. So, um, I, no, I'd contacted him last week and asked him if he had something on his heart that would be encouraging and uplifting. And he said the Lord had already been giving him something that he was working on. So, anyway, Mr. Joffrey Panero is going to share with us tonight. So, as he comes up, I want us all to pray and that just the Father open our ears to what the Father has to say to us tonight, okay? So our Father in heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, we are grateful and thankful to you for this day that you have made. Help us to always be thankful for every day. When we're on top of the mountain or if we're in the valley, we, are, we want to be thankful and we want to rejoice in the day that you've given us because we know that all things work together for good for, for those who love you and you bring your will and your purpose together in our lives. So we are grateful. And I pray, Father, that you would um, not only anoint, but that you would just uh, lead and guide our speaker tonight, Joffrey, and Father, put in his mouth the words that you have for us tonight. And help us all to receive it with ears that are willing to hear and receive what the Spirit has to say to all of us. These things we pray and ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. So Joffrey, come on up. Let's encourage him, everybody. Hello. Okay. Hello, family. How is everyone? Good. Oh, so I get to open up the new year uh, with the first message. I, I just realized that. So, um, my water. What I'm going to talk about this evening is in Matthew chapter five, commonly referred to the Beatitudes, and everybody. I'm sure is familiar with the Beatitudes. Typically, everyone thinks of them as eight, but there's actually nine. And so that's where my focus is going to be tonight. Um, and Bill, open up in prayer. I, I just ask, Lord, give me strength and, and put your words into my mouth. So what I want to begin with is, first, I want to begin with this. We all know 
that we are commanded to abstain from fleshly lust. We all know that we're to put off the old man and put on the new. To think on those things which are above and not below. To be honorable and pure in our thoughts. To let the word of God dwell in us richly. To have no unclean word come out of our mouth. Only that which is edifying and building up for the body. To bear no offense. To hold no grudges. To put on the full armor of God. To imitate Messiah. And to imitate Paul as he imitated Messiah. So what's the problem? We all know this. So why is the church so powerless? Why is there still division? Why is there still um, shame and guilt uh, weighing us down? Why are we still having little quarrels amongst ourselves? Why are we not united? I submit to you it's because we have missed the message from the beginning. Not from Genesis. From Sermon on the Mount from the Beatitudes, from Yeshua's ministry, where it began. That's the beginning. John Stott said this. He said, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Yeshua, Jesus, though arguably the least understood and certainly the least obeyed. The message doesn't come, this message is not coming from a place of expertise. I'm not an expert. I have no letters behind my name. I am a student who loves the word of God, who wants to share the word of God, to give, to tell everyone where to find bread and water. That's my job. That's my desire. That's my passion. I am by no means an expert in this. And so I'm sharing this from just study and deep prayer and a lot of humility. Um, to begin with, Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read the Beatitudes. I'm going to, like, I'm short on time, so technically each one of these could be a sermon in themselves or a message. But I'm going to open up with verse 1. And I may stop there depending on what the Spirit says. Um, verse 5, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are you, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you, they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. I'm going to stop there. The main reason for sharing this, like I said, after reading the Sermon on the Mount and really chewing on it, I found immediately I was convicted and compelled. Yeshua is speaking of a life that's blessed, a life blessed by God and gives us the why and the how. And who doesn't want to be blessed? We all do. We all do, but I think we all fail to truly understand the cost of discipleship. In Luke 14, 26 and 27, Yeshua pretty much lays out what it's going to take. He says that all relationships, and I'm paraphrasing, must be subjected to him. In short, what he says in that chapter, that passage, he says that unless you hate, and he's using hyperbole, unless you hate your mother, father, sister, brother, children, even your very life, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. That's the level of commitment he's asking us to 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 do. That's the disciple he's looking for. That's the one that's going to walk into the kingdom. That's the one that he says, blessed are you. That's the blessing. Along with that blessing, in Matthew 20, that's the time when the disciples said, who's the greatest? They wanted to know who is the greatest, who's going to sit at his right hand. He said, that's not for me to determine, but what you, you don't know what you ask because you will drink from the same cup. 
You will be immersed from, with the same immersion that I'm immersed in. In other words, you're going to divinely be appointed for suffering. That's the, that's the key. None of us want to suffer. In America right now, the church hasn't even begun to understand the level of suffering that's coming. The church has not suffered unto blood, the shedding of blood, imprisonment, or death. But yet, we're comfortable. We're complacent. It's a time for us to grow. It's a time for us to put in the work. It's a time for us no longer to be complacent, but to be expected. And in that expectancy comes the blessing of the Lord. And if you look at the blessing, the beatitudes, you'll notice in Deuteronomy 28, it has the same thing. That's the blessing of the Lord. Sure, we like nice things, fancy clothes, cars, houses, etc. God is gracious and he provides. Yes, he does. But as Job said, I came in with nothing. I'm going out with nothing. And there's never been a U-Haul behind a hearst. No one goes to war without counting the cost. No one builds a tower without counting the cost. No one remodels a home without first counting the cost. And that's what Yeshua is saying. You count the cost. We all know we are commanded to be holy as he is holy. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. Leviticus 11, Leviticus 19, 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. In Exodus, Moses asked of the Lord, he said, show me, show him. He wanted him to show him his way that he may know him and find grace, i.e. favor or putting it another way, blessing. In Exodus 34, the Lord reveals his goodness, his attributes to Moses. In the Sermon on the Mount, Slash Beatitudes, Yeshua, who is in the likeness of man, reveals his attributes, his goodness, so that we may know him and share those qualities. I believe Yeshua is not only laying out the traits and characteristics of an authentic follower, but also the pathway to holiness. It's not rules and regulations. The mechanics are easy. That's the easy part. The hard part is transformation. Dying completely to self, staying on the altar, not crawling off the altar. Because a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service, wants to crawl off. We all are in a process of sanctification, but this is a time, this is a season where I believe Jacob's tent is not only a hospital, a training center, a launching pad, apostolic, evangelical, spirit-filled, God-fearing, God-honoring, Torah observant people who are designed and are called for greater things and the exploits we have yet to see. But we have to believe that in our hearts and we have to apprehend the, the character of, Mash of Mashiach unless we fail and fall when that time comes. And it's coming. There's a storm coming and a shaking is going to happen. And all of us will be faced with those trials and there'll be a division where there'll be sheep on one side and goats on the other. Ezekiel 9 says the angel will go out with the ink horn marking his people who shall not be touched by what is coming. Read Ezekiel 9, it'll terrify the socks off you. I don't know where that, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to preach. <sighs> So the Beatitudes are indicative of a changed heart, a spirit-filled heart in alignment with Yeshua. The sermon, the sermon on the Mount is the spirit behind the Torah. The Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes are the Torah. They're the character of one who follows the Torah. Torah, God, the gospel, the Torah are not supposed to be separate. They're together. And we are called in the kingdom. He proclaimed the kingdom. These are kingdom principles. That is Yeshua is discussing. It's a call to duty. It's a call to holiness. The word blessed in the Greek is makarios. If you want to look that up, that's Strong's number 3107. And it literally means happy. That's the meaning. But it carries another meaning. It also carries the meaning of a position of favor. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. 
But his delight is in the Torah of the, and the Lord, and on this Torah he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that, does, that produces its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Amen? That should be an amen or an ouch. Blessedness is a heart and mind condition given by God that cannot be moved regardless of circumstance, situation, whatever may come, you are blessed. Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Either way, I trust the Lord. Job understood this. Moses understood this. Joseph, David, all experienced great trials and suffering, yet the blessing of the Lord never departed from them. Why? Because they stayed with their heart and mind on him. That was the reason. We have examples of the opposite. Esau, Saul, Judas. Read the book of Kings, especially the, the kings of Israel. There were very, very few good kings, a lot of bad ones. The Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes convey Torah in action. It's a picture of when Yeshua will teach the nations. Why do I say that? Isaiah 2, 3. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we will walk in the paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The Beatitudes are not multiple choice. They are not cherry pick. They're not a menu you can just pick anything from. It's the entire package. And we have a tendency, and I think this is because of our our Christian background that we just kind of look at the Beatitudes and kind of glance over them and pick what we want or say, yeah, yeah I'm not there yet. Or, and I think that's wrong. I think we need to grow, grow up. And, and he's calling for maturity. Believers who are sold out in heart, mind, and spirit. It's a dying, continual dying, dying daily. Uh, Yeshua uh, is giving us the job requirements for authentic, authentic citizens of the kingdom. This is really, when I read this, I looked at it and said, this is Yeshua's Shema, hearing, doing. Think about it. That's how I looked at that. And when you say you're not there yet, I have trouble with that. I know one of the convictions in, uh, that I received in the passages I read was 2 Peter 1.3. And it, said, it says, by his divine power, he has given us all things, not some things, all things pertaining to life and godliness. It is by his divine power that he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So the problem is our flesh. It's this stuff. We need to really get a hold of not only spiritual disciplines, but we need to count everything lost for the excellency of Christ. That's what Paul did. That's what he said. And so... That verse really stood out to me. Also, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special treasure that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And if you notice the elements, number one, a chosen generation. He picked you for such a time as this. Number two, a royal priesthood, position and authority. Number three, a holy nation, unity in the body, one spirit. Number four, special people or treasure, unconditional love. You were bought with a price. Five, to proclaim his praise, your calling, your purpose, your function, your testimony, your joy, and your thanksgiving are all there. Claim it, own it, and grab a hold of that and believe it. Most of all, believe it. So with all this in mind, Yeshua describes those who are blessed, those who are in the kingdom. And the kingdom is within you. Amen. He said that. I didn't. The kingdom is within you. So what, what does this do? This begs the question of a personal inventory, a, an audit, if you will, which we should do at least once a week. We should go before the Father, be on our knees, and we should cry out to the Lord and ask the Lord to search our heart to see if there be any wickedness in us, to really understand our walk and to really submit to his rule and authority. And that should be done. That's part of our, 
our discipleship and our discipline because anybody else may not be watching, but he's always watching. And that makes a difference. Uh, my mentor told me that every day before, when you get out of bed, you drop on your knees and you thank him for breath. You thank him for sight. You thank him for, for hearing. You thank him for everything. The first thing you do and you pray. Why? Because like the grass that receives the dew in the early morning to protect it from the sunlight in the afternoon, you're receiving the dew of the spirit to protect you from the filth that you're going to encounter in the world that day. Make sense? So as I was reading the Beatitudes, I asked myself these questions. Am I displaying the attributes that are described here? Am I the person described in Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Am I following the teachings of Yeshua in the Sermon on the Mount? How can I improve and change for the betterment of others, not self, others? Because the point of the entire sermon is selfless, not self more. Selfless. The entire point of Torah is selfless. And Psalm 65, 4, blessed is the man that, ch that you choose and cause to walk in your courts, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Psalm 119, 2, blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. James 1, 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he is approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And in Revelation, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. Least he walk naked and they see his shame. The fourth thing you will discover in the Beatitudes, it leads you to a heart of worship. What you hear Yeshua do, you see him do. And, you sh and when, this, when this begins to happen and you read this book, and when this book begins to read you, I should say, that's when worship begins. When this book reads you and not you read it. And that's the point. In Matthew, um, there's a quote. You don't see this in, in Matthew chapter 5, but in Matthew chapter 5, what you do see is Isaiah being quoted, Isaiah 9. It says, um, in Galilee, a great light came to those who were living in darkness. The Beatitudes are, is the way of light. But you'll see Isaiah 61 and Luke, which... Is anyone familiar with the Sermon of, on the Plain? Raise your hand. Anyone? I wasn't either. Sermon on the Plain is part of the Sermon on the Mount, but the time frames are different. This is what's interesting. Remember I said, in the beginning I may stop. Okay, in the beginning of Matthew, I don't know where I'm going with this, Lord. In the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, it says, Yeshua went up the mountain. Now, follow me. He went up the mountain, and he was seated. His disciples came to him. Typically, a rabbi sits when he teaches, and, the, and disciples stand. They don't sit. They stand. Now, when you get to Luke on chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain, it's a whole different scenario. Yeshua is now coming down. And he's coming down, and the multitude are down there. But he's coming with his disciples, the 12. Picking it up yet? He's coming down. Along there is the mixed multitude. There's also people from Tyre and Sidon. Wealthy seacoast, so wealthy people. There's also people who are sick and diseased. There are also people who have unclean spirits. And it also says he went out, and power came out from him. And he's teaching his disciples, and it's in the second pronoun. You are. You. The first is in the third. Sort of sounds like Sinai, doesn't it? God came on top of a mountain. Moses went up. But now God comes in, in the likeness of man. He comes down to meet us so we see him face to face. And eventually we will see him face to face, and we will be like him. I kind of went off track, but I felt that was important. 
So chew on that. There's some homework for you. See if it reveals anything to you. I just found that interesting that he's going up and then he's coming down. And in Isaiah or Luke chapter 6, Isaiah 61, which is all the Beatitudes, which is the personality and character of Yeshua, which is also, and I'll get to that, it's his announcement and fulfillment of Isaiah 51. So where was I? I lost my place. <laughs> um, none of us, like I said, have suffered unto uh, physical death or imprisonment or bloodshed. Um, some may say, I'm a true follower of Messiah. And I would say, why? Because I keep the Torah. Well, that's a good answer. That's a real good answer. So did the rich young ruler and the lawyer. Didn't work out too well. Some may say, I do good works. I take care of people. I'm a nice guy. That's a good answer too, but good deeds are required. However, Yeshua said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Even in Matthew 23, 28, he calls the, the Pharisees, he says, hypocrites. He calls them lawless. Now, these are the Pharisees who keep the Torah, but he calls them lawless. And then in Matthew 7, 21, 22, the one chapter and passage we like to beat our Christian brothers over the head with, uh, he says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Well, he never says anything about their giftings. He says, depart from me because you never had a relationship with me in the first place. So both occasions are focused on the self and not on Yeshua dying to self. That's the point of both of those. It has nothing to do with being Torahlessness, lawlessness, iniquity. Sure, that's there. But the main reason he says it, I don't have a relationship with you. So I don't know you, period. He doesn't say anything about their gifts. He doesn't, he doesn't even attack the Pharisees for, for practicing the Torah. He, he calls them Torahlessness. Same word, lawlessness. The blessings of God are not going to be found in position or personality, 401ks, retirement programs, none of that. God does provide, absolutely. So in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit realize first their need. I think this is the most important one of them all. Because without this one, the, you can't have the others. The Beatitudes are progressive. They intensify. It's a continual more dying, more dying, more dying. The Sermon on the Mount, same way. Yeshua takes it up to a higher level. He never does away with the Torah like he says. We know that. He takes things to a, a higher position so that we may apprehend his exact character and likeness so that we may become citizens of the kingdom. It's always he proclaims the kingdom. That's the point. Being poor in spirit, like I said, is the most important because unless we recognize our need for a savior, unless we recognize that the heart is desperately wicked above all else, you'll never progress. Truly, to truly be his disciple, none of us can skip this step. The Beatitudes are progressive. I'm going to give you an example in Luke 7. How much time? Luke 7. I'm running out of time. 7.33. Go to Luke 7, chapter, Luke chapter 7, verse 33, real quick. This is kind of the position we should be in. And, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. And verse 36 of chapter 7. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Yeshua sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster flask, of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Yeshua said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. 
And he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debts, two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? And Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I've entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased from kissing my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And further on, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's poor in spirit. That's someone who recognizes their need. That's someone who humbles themselves before the feet of the Messiah. That's the picture of a poor spirit. That's where we need to be. Not just once in a while, all the time. I know I need that all the time because life is hard. People are hard. Things are hard. And we need that continually washing, that coming to the foot of our Messiah. So that's a picture of, a, of, a, of the poor in spirit. Psalm 51, sacrifices of God are broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Isaiah 66, 2, but on this one will I look upon on him who is poor and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. The writer of Hebrews even says that Moses even trembled at the word of God. And Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And if you play close attention, Moses exemplified those nine attributes in the Beatitudes perfectly. Yeshua is giving us his, like I said, his Shema. And if you want to follow me, he says, this is the standard. This is the job description, in other words. This is what I'm expecting. This is my true and authentic follower. Yeshua put it another way in Luke 4.25. And I already quoted this. If anyone comes to me or wants to follow me, he must die to himself and give up and subjugate all other relationships, paraphrased. So that's the purpose of the Beatitudes. The focus really, when he was teaching these, was on his disciples, not necessarily the multitudes. That came in Luke chapter six. But in Luke chapter five, the real focus is on his disciples. He's teaching them. In John 15, 16, we are appointed to bear fruit, fruit that remains. The Bible says also he chose us before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. We are to keep our conscience clean so that we are not slandering, that we have no ill thoughts, that this is the washing in the water of the word, daily in the word. We are to practice spiritual disciplines, we are to pray fast. These are things that uh, we are called to do. An athlete who doesn't train isn't going to win a contest. A boxer who doesn't train isn't going to win. So we, are this, we have been called to such a higher level of training that sometimes we forget that. And we take this for granted. I know I've done that. And the spiritual disciplines we must continually practice is studying in the word, prayer and fasting, confession and repentance, treating others like you want to be treated. These are things that he's teaching us in the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are a way of life for all of us to follow in Yeshua's footsteps. The totality of the spirit is here. It's the Torah in the spirit. It's the spirit of the Torah. That's the Beatitudes. There are just... This is really something I really want to share. This is a side note. If you, and this is homework, too. This is more homework. Read Exodus 20. If you want to write these down, read Exodus 20. Take the Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7. Then read John 15, and then go to 2 Peter chapter 1 through 11. And what you have there, in my opinion, 
is your discipleship program. Put them all together. I challenge you to read those together, just those. Exodus 20, Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7, John 15, and 2 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 11. Read those. That's your discipleship program. So where do you find the poor in spirit, the meek? If you look at Psalm 119, I'm going to go through these quickly. Psalm 119, 57, 58, poor in spirit. Psalm 30, 11, Psalm 51, those who are mourned. Psalm 37, 11, the meek. Isaiah 55, 1, those who hunger and thirst. Psalm 41, verses 1 and 2. Romans 9, 15, merciful. Psalm 15, 2, the pure in heart. John 14, 27, and Romans 8, 6, the peacemakers. 1 Peter 3, 14, and James 1 through 4 are those who are persecuted. Uh, Psalm 61, 1 through 3 encapsulates the entire Beatitudes if you read that. How much time do I have? What Yeshua is teaching is not only completely contrary to our human nature, but it's countercultural as well. Especially in today's world, um, it's counterintuitive, it's uncomfortable. One minute he says, Blessed are the peacemakers. The next minute he says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Then he says, I leave you my peace. My peace I give to you. My peace I, lift, I leave with you. So there's, there's those kind of things happening. And so we get kind of confused about that. Yeshua is calling us to something we're not capable. It's not that he's calling us to something we're not capable of doing, especially with the giving of the Holy Spirit, because that's the main ingredient. That's the transformation. That's, what, that's the thing that transformed the heart and the mind is the spirit. The transformation starts from the inside. If you're going to win this battle for holiness, it has to be won on the inside. It cannot be won on the outside. Mechanics and accoutrements don't matter. If this isn't right and isn't changed, if this isn't broken and contrite, no matter what you do, you will fail and you will fall. Period. That goes for me. I'm talking to myself. It's the battle is on the inside first. And Yeshua says that clean the outside of the clean the inside of the cup and dish first, that the outside may be clean. Woe unto you, Pharisees, you hypocrites, etc., etc., etc. The difference is this: the kingdom of God, there's the kingdom of God that we hear about, and then there's the kingdom of heaven. We all have heard those two things interchangeably. The kingdom of heaven, this is something where God dwells. This is where he rule and reigns. The difference is this. The kingdom of God is within you. We are the subjects of the king and he is our Lord and he is our king and we obey his rule. The kingdom of heaven is where he reigns and rules. That is our destination. The, there will be a new kingdom and a new earth eventually. We know that, Revelation 21. Um, heaven is the ultimate reward. Those who mourn in verse four. Now, those who mourn, let me get there. There's three kinds of mourning. There's a natural mourning. There's a sinful mourning. And there's a spiritual mourning or spiritual grieving. We could use the word grieve in place of mourn. He's talking, and, and as far as a natural mourning, that's when we lose someone, the loss of a loved one, the grieving over a child who's in the world and who was lost. Um, that's, that's natural. That's expected. David grieved over his son. Now, here's the thing. In 2 Samuel 12, David grieved over his son that he had with Bathsheba. And the Lord also said he would pay four times. And he did because he lost his sons. If you, if you put the connection together. But when he lost his son, as his son was dying, he was grieving. After he died... What did David say? Because they asked him, well, you know, why aren't you grieving and fasting and doing all? And you're washed up, cleaned up, joyful, happy. He says, because I know I'll see him again. That's why. So if that's comforting, just understand that 
David said that I know I'll see him again. In other places, David says, I can't wait to awake in your likeness. Speaks of resurrection. The sinful grieving, Saul, Ammon, for example, who wanted to have sex with his sister, and he was so sick that he couldn't, and he was mourning, a sinful mourning. Ahab, for example, who was mourning so bad he got sick, wouldn't eat or anything because he wanted Nabal's vineyard. That's sinful mourning. In a way, you could even say Judas had sinful mourning. Now, spiritual mourning, this is what Yeshua is talking about. Spiritual mourning, he is talking about grieving over the actions and behaviors a sinful city, sinful life, lifestyle, the sin of others. In Jeremiah chapter 9, I believe. I thought I had it there. Chapter 9. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. Why? Because he's weeping over the unrepented city. He's trying to tell, look, judgment's coming. He's weeping for them. Spiritual mourning is a weeping for the sin and the heartbreak that you see. For the lifestyle, for this world, we should be praying for our nation. We should be praying for our sons and our daughters. Intercession, it's a form of intercession, and it is a form of protection and power at the same time. Because we're standing in the gap like Moses says, no, 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 don't kill him because you'll it, you know, profane your name. Don't do that. That's, sin, that's spiritual mourning. We want to stand in the gap for our loved ones. We want to mourn because of the lifestyle that they're living in and want to draw them back so desperately. That's spiritual mourning. That's good stuff. That's okay. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul addresses this same thing. He, he, I don't have it memorized. 2 Corinthians 7.10, let's go there real quick. I told you I had a lot of stuff. Uh, Here it is. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Godly sorrow should produce repentance. It should produce life. And that's the reason for our spiritual sorrow. We're hoping to restore life, not sorrow. Like the world's repentance produces death. It doesn't produce life. And so Paul addresses that same issue in the Beatitudes. Mourning also builds a character trait we wouldn't get without the suffering. It forges us, and it's like being in an oven. The righteous are found where? Anybody? Furnace of affliction. Affliction is a good thing. It produces character traits we normally wouldn't have any other way. So God uses those things for our benefit and for our good. Uh, Joseph, for example, primary case where Joseph, we know what he went through. We just did the Torah portion. It was through affliction. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word and you are good and your statutes are good. The quality trader standard are the meek of the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, which also speaks of the millennial kingdom. We know that. Meekness does not mean weakness. It's power under control. It's like the stallion who's been tamed, strong, but yet he's tamed. We are to be tamed by the Holy Spirit, but full of power and might to operate in his character and his likeness that we shall not be moved That's meekness. It's humility. Um, Brother John brought a message about humility, if you remember. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of vain selfish ambition, but in humility and lowness of mind, let each esteem others greater than himself. Uh, the, The Greek word for that is to domesticate an animal. So we become domesticated because a lot of us, I know I did, I came, I had a lot of beast nature in me. And I had to be domesticated. And that's what the Lord does. He domesticates us, brings us low. He humbles us. Number four, 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now notice the first three Beatitudes were dying to self, submission, poor in spirit, those who mourn and being weak. Now here he's talking about getting filled up. I want more, of, we want more of his righteousness. We want more of him. The righteousness is imputed by faith, not by self-righteousness. There are none righteous, no, not one, the Bible says. So he answers the, he answers the plea by dying, but answers our plea by dying on the cross, that we may have more of him. It was his dying now that gives us that hunger and thirst for righteousness. He has opened the doorway for us to receive that. He's imputed his righteousness. There's a great exchange there. Isaiah 61 says that we may become the trees of righteousness planted by the Lord. Amen. And 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Number five, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Justice is getting what you deserve, but mercy is, getting, is not getting what you deserve. So why mercy? Peter said, how many times do I forgive my brother? Anyone remember? 70 times 70, another hyperbole. He meant always. We are to do the same. They are to carry no grudges, bear no resentments. The greatest weapon John Bevere said of the devil was offense. I think that's right on the, right on the money. I think he's right. And uh, that's a good book. I don't know why I brought that up, but he, that was, that's a good book. John, I remember reading that years ago. That's one of the greatest tools of the enemy. Let's cause offense. We cause division. We cause resentment. They don't walk in the Beatitudes. So I don't know why I said that, but food for thought. So as recipients of his mercy, we are now to be dispensers of that same mercy. We are to pay it forward, not keep it. Pay it forward. That's authentic. That's an authentic citizen of the kingdom. That's what he does. Uh, what we receive freely, we give. We should give. Now, sometimes there's, it's, we see a hypocritical judgment or hypocritical, and then there's judgment. And, and the whole mercy thing, I mean, hypocritically speaking, because we receive something, we want to keep it. Or... We, we don't want to give it away. And, and that, in that same sense, we become judging as well. We want to give something. We want to receive something, but we don't want to give it to anybody else because we feel they don't deserve it. Why should they have mercy? And that's not a good thing to have. And I've seen that happen. Beatitude number six, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now the Pharisees, We're always concerned about outward appearance, as we know. And I alluded to Matthew 23. I'm not going to say that again because I just said that. So Matthew 23, he, he calls them out. He rebukes the socks off them. That doesn't mean he won't do it to us. In Psalm 51, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Second Samuel 6, God looks at the inside as man looks at the outside. Rituals and traditions don't clean the heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Now in the book of Acts, the first nine chapters, which is mostly to a Jewish audience, and then you get to chapter 10, and that's when you come to the house of Cornelius. And now the Holy Spirit is given to the Gentiles. And they're really not sure what to do. Acts chapter 15, they have the Jerusalem council. And, and Paul says, or yeah, Peter says, I perceive that God who knows the heart has given them, the Gentiles, as he has given us the purifying of their hearts through faith and the Holy Spirit. In John 3, 2, beloved, now we are children of God. It has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
And the beatitude number seven, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. We are to be facilitators of peace, ambassadors of reconciliation. The word appears 429 times. Appearing first in Genesis 15, 15, Yeshua is called the Prince of Peace. And by virtue of his lordship over us, we are to conduct ourselves in the bond of peace. It's all over the scripture. Peace, peace, peace. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. So being a peacemaker should be self-evident. It's prima facie. It shouldn't have to talk. We, sh we shouldn't have to talk too much about that. Um, it's a Torah principle that needs really no further explanation. Shalom, we use the word shalom. So peace should be a no-brainer. That's our call, to be peacemakers, ambassadors, breach fixers, etc. Love is always the first point and the first thing. Do you pursue peace and pursue godliness? Why? Because without them, finish it, you shall not see God, period. Cancel Christmas. I thought I'd throw that out there. My mentor used to say that a lot. <laughs> okay, so where was I? Oh, See, the church has not yet experienced true persecution, like I said earlier. Um, we've gotten comfortable. And we see the carrot, we haven't seen the stick yet. Our government leaders uh, speak out of both sides of their mouth. They're like grasshoppers hopping from one pinion to the next. Um, and we're, I believe, are in a time, the time of Jericho, when Joshua sent two. Now, see if you can track with me on this one. This is something I, I kind of picked up. Joshua sends two spies into Jericho to check out the city. They check out the city, and of course, there's the fear of the Lord went before them and the dread of him, of them. And then they come back. Of course, one, Rahab, was a smart one. And she was delivered, promised, and delivered. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 9, the anger of the Lord is so great, he sends out this angel, like I said earlier, with the ink horn, to mark his people because of the abominations and the cry of their heart. They see all this stuff going on because he says in Ezekiel 9, kill everything, wipe them out, but do not touch the ones I have marked. Basically, the ones that I have chosen. And so, why did I put those two together? Because in those chapters and in chapter 23, of Exodus and Leviticus as well, it says, the Lord says, I'm going to send the fear of you and the dread of you before you. And the day is coming when all this stuff is gonna happen. And as we said in the army, the balloon goes up, but the Lord will send the fear of you and the dread of you before them. We will become public enemy number one. However, it's because they fear us. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of sound love and a sound mind. The fear of you and the dread of you. Read Exodus chapter 23 and Leviticus 18. Make sense? Is it a promise? I think so. And so I want to leave, leave you guys with this. Um, I'm cutting it short. Uh, Romans 15. These things were written for our learning. The Ascala. That they would be an example for us. Speaking of the Tanakh. There's other passages that said these things are an example for us. We are to look at those stories in the Tanakh and learn from them because history repeats itself. And we're seeing a lot of similarities between Israel and the United States. There's a lot of stuff that's parallel. So those are an example. Those things are there for our learning and our admonition.
So I want, I want to leave you with a prayer. And this is from Peter as well. But you, beloved, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As one has received a gift to minister one to another, be as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Be ready in your heart and soul. You are the bride of Yeshua. You are a chosen generation. Live in love and don't despise the chasing of the Lord because he loves you and he has great things planned for you. And do not fear. Let Jacob's tent be the place of love, a place of sincerity, a place that has the attributes that are described in the Beatitudes. Amen. Amen. Oh, one more thing real quick. Ah, I left this out. My wife and I are nerds. We read everything. I got this book, a friend of mine who I call occasionally for help with Hebrew. It's from the Musar, which is a Jewish tradition on living. It's got a little journal in here. And basically, it's a way to check um, your traits, whether or not you're living in kindness and generosity. And it's from the, true, the Musar. Um, that's one. And then Rabbi Ashir has a book on Amuna and living in Amuna. And that's also very good as well. So there's this. Faith, belief, but it's in action. If no one understands what Amuna, belief and faith. Um, it is the cornerstone of the Torah. And who else is the cornerstone? And where are we to have our belief and faith in? Yeshua. Give him praise and glory. Amen. If you didn't see this one. You're, you're fine. You're fine. So let, let's, uh, again, let's thank Joffrey for sharing with us tonight. So what we usually do is if anybody has any questions or anything like that or comments, you know, that, you know, this is the time for them to do that. So you hold this mic. Yes, sir. Okay. So Jeff Stath, can you do me a favor? I'm lazy. Walk this microphone back to that gentleman right back there. Hey, brother. Thank you. Hello, Thank you so Doug. much for that message. It was, uh, it, the Spirit has been challenging me in the same manner of what you're speaking. And, um, and what I've been coming to understand is, is this, this lack between knowledge of what is good and understanding or reading and taking and the difference between that and walking and not just walking here or walking there and partly walking in it but as James calls out like if you're not counting the cost if you're not willing to fully walk it out then why even try to walk I mean that's a challenging thing to ask yourself. But those attributes that Yeshua is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount and these things, um, you know, he lived that life. He was the example and the example that we are to look to, like you pointed out. I, I've often thought and wondered um, for several years now, many years actually, you know, amongst all the believers that we have, especially in like America and how many professed believers that we have. I mean, we're a nation full of people that claim that God is their God and, 
you know, and that they met Jesus or they know Jesus or Yeshua. And I'm challenged to that if if Yeshua was to present himself, first off, he's a the most humble person, the most servant. He put when he was down, you know, when he was living this life, he was the lowliest. Like if he was to even walk in the room, would we even recognize him? Would we even Well would he recognize us? Would he recognize us, but would we even see him? Or right. would you know, and how what would our reaction be? You know, if if we didn't know, if he didn't walk in and say, Hey guys, I'm the king, you know. Right. Right. Um, so it's been a I've been challenged in the same way, and I just want to thank you for your message and you're, just you're welcome. Um, you're welcome, um, David. And confirm, man, that mm-hmm. the spirit is is drawing us to that because until we are a people that are walking in that, not only as a congregation, but as individuals. I mean, I'm looking for the day. I I, I hope that I'm part of that. You know, I hope that my life would would be one that is selected for that. But I'm waiting for the day to see somebody, you know, walking so full in the spirit like they were in the time that things were just happening, not because they were wanting them to happen, but because our Father's spirit is about restoration and healing and restoring hope and building up vessels that are broken. And, and, and I want to see somebody shining like Moses. Just know he's got it, you know, right. or something like that. And that, that may be extreme, but if, if, he's, if his spirit is really going to rest on our lives the way he's called for this time that most of us think we're living in, then shouldn't we be expecting something like that? Shouldn't we be, I mean, striving yes. to get there? And I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. And that's the point. The point is that you notice when persecution comes, then the church comes alive. That's the point. The seeds are planted. But persecution, suffering, we have no idea what that. Now, other countries, we hear about that. And what happens? We hear of explosions happening, revival starting. That's when revival will start, when there is persecution. Um, little tidbit here. If you are arrested and brought before a judge in a court of law, is there enough evidence to convict you as being a follower of Yeshua? And I'm sure some of us have heard that. I thought about that recently and I thought, mm, are you going to get off on the technicality? The world has a lot of technicalities. The churches today are full of technicalities. And it's time for us to grow and to start doing the work. Um, where are you? You didn't? Uh, <laughs> I, was ask, I was just asking Jeff if you were help us out with the microphone. That's all. Anyone? I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Would you uh, comment a little deeper on what is ungodly judgment and what is godly judgment? Ungodly judgment, or when I was referring to, what was I referring to? Let me get my notes. Uh, I think you were talking about hypocritical versus, yes, okay. So... So like I said, so being recipients of his mercy, we are to be dispensers of that same mercy. Uh, We become hypocritical when we receive something freely, but we don't want to give it away. And it's been freely given us, freely you have received, freely give. Judgmental because we're saying, I deserve it, but you don't. That's what I mean by that. So we... We receive something, but we don't think this other person should have this because why? Well, look at them. They did this and they did that. And so what we become is we step into the camp of the accuser of the brethren. Bingo. When we listen to stuff, tasty morsels, trifles go down deep in the innermost. We step into the camp of the enemy, et cetera, et cetera. You you guys know. So I don't need to go any further with that. Pastor Bill... Well, he already touched on all that, so I'm not going to go any further. Can you define meekness? Oh. We were just going to read that question for you. Can you define meekness in a practical, everyday situation 
in relationship and in workplace. Yes, humility. And it looks like this. Not trying to be a head and shoulders above the rest. When you're in your workplace, you're the guy that, that helps others in need. Like, for example, with me, we work as a team. We don't work, we don't work uh, one guy trying to outdo the other or try to, you know, with the boss. Uh, practically speaking, you're willing to lend a hand around here. We try to help each other. When anyone is in need, we're there to, to help them. So practically speaking, that's what meekness looks like. It's humility in action. Does that answer the question? All right. I guess that's it. I, I guess that's all. Let's again, let's thank Joffrey. For, thank you, sir. All righty. So I guess we're going to stop a little early if there are no more questions or comments. All right. Um, did, you, did you say anything about prayer needs, particularly? Is it, huh? I would like to encourage everyone to pray for anyone that you know who is sick, um, who is injured, who has uh, any kind of need other than physical as well. Sangwani had someone? Deborah Peterson? Okay, let's pray for Debbie. And Candace, absolutely. Yeah, we're missing Candace. She's um, little by little, she's getting better. So let's pray that she continues to improve. Um, and we miss you, Candace. Get well. So we need you back here. Um, same for you, Deborah. And then we also want to pray for um, Ginger and Gary. Um, a lot of you have maybe been talking to your tribe captains. Um, Gary's not doing well. And we, our prayer first is, Abba, you touch him, heal him. You know, we are selfish. We want to keep him here with us. But Ultimately, your will be done. So let's pray for Abba's will and for peace in whatever that is because he knows so much better than we do and he can do it so much better than we can and his timing is perfect and ours is selfish. So it doesn't mean we're mean and ugly. It just means we just really love the ones that he puts in our lives. We want them here as long as we can have them. But it's, um, they're in a difficult situation now. Uh, we we get, did get to meet their daughter, who seems to be a very nice young lady. We got to spend a few minutes with them yesterday. But I just pray, you know, ask you to join us in praying for Gary and for Ginger. They're in a very difficult situation right now. Um, and just for the, the Father's peace there. Yes. Is there anyone else real quick? I'm going to have you come back up and you're going to pray, Okay. Is there anyone else we need to that specifically we need to be praying for about a situation? Okay, I mainly wanted Beth to. I know that everybody knows, but we just just keep the Grims in prayer. All right, and uh, and pray that the Father will give everybody strength to endure whatever it is He has determined they need to endure. All right, will you pray for these brother? Yes. These others and these others as well. All right. If everyone, uh, everyone would stand, please, as Joffrey leads us in prayer. Again, thank you, Joffrey, for sharing with us tonight. We appreciate it, brother. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, and just real quick, that's the morning we're speaking about, the spiritual morning and, and the natural morning. So we definitely lift up Ginger and Gary. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for your goodness and your graciousness, which we see each and every day. Let us never take it for granted. Help us to love upon one another as you have loved us, that we may be one with you as you are with the Father. 
We lift up those right now who are hurting and who are suffering and have ailments. We just ask that you would comfort their hearts and bring a peace to them that surpasses all understanding. And anyone out there watching on the live stream, may your heart be set at ease. May we, O oh Lord, be formed in the image and the likeness of your son. May we apprehend these attitudes to be authentic, not only to each other, but before you and before man, that they may know that we are your disciples. May we have strength in the coming storm, that's the shaking, and may we withstand it and bold like Peter and John were, that we rejoice. At the end, it's you say, rejoice and let your reward is be exceedingly glad because your reward is in heaven. Let us know that that's our eternal destination, but in the meantime, let us perform as citizens of the kingdom. We thank you this evening for this time. May we go in peace and may the peace of your covering be upon each and every one of us, upon our children and upon our family members. In the name of Yeshua Messiah, amen. All right. So our, our young people are going to be coming down in just a little bit. So you've got a little time to say hello and greet one another. Uh, wait for them to come down. But after they come down, then go get your lost and found. Okay? Okay? About 8.45-ish, we're going to ask everybody to kind of uh, go out of the room because uh, praise and worship team needs to go over a few things before Shabbat. So just FYI. Everybody be safe tonight. Y'all also, please remember, we're wanting to surprise Mike and have not even a tissue left in here for him to pick up. And our live stream family did report that many of them were in fuzzy socks, which fuzzy socks are my favorite. I love fuzzy socks. But they were in pajamas, fuzzy socks, and some were even eating popcorn. And at the suggestion of it, a lot and went, a lot of them went and got popcorn. So just had to report. We know you so well.